<laughs> so welcome to today's session on paper two for prelim revision. Um, and of course, very useful for your final paper for maths as well. So what's the plan? Or what's in paper two? Well, firstly, statistics, which is my favorite. Um, and then analytical geometry, trigonometry, and of course, the dreaded use of the geometry and measurements. So um, if you have watched paper one, you'll have heard all of this before, but I do want to repeat it because if you haven't, it is kind of important. So make sure you get enough sleep. Your brain does not function optimally on three hours of sleep, no matter how young you think you are. Uh, <laughs> just trust me on this one. And then when you do start studying from that, study for a long time in advance. Give yourself time to go through stuff. Remember, uh, maths is not just a theory paper, it's also an application paper. So you have to be able to apply what you've learned, right? And this follows along with that is practice, practice, practice. So the way to study for maths is actually to practice maths. Um, so we have a lot of worksheets on maths.sharp.coza. If you are looking for something to practice with, they are all free. They have fully worked out memos for you. So take a look there. And then of course, try the question first before you check your answer. Okay, try and do it. Don't just check the answer because then you aren't learning anything and you aren't learning from your mistakes either. Then eat healthy. Your brain thrives on healthy, on water, on um, vegetables. I know, shock horror. Um, <laughs> it's not going to be happy if you just feed it donuts for three days in a row and your brain or your body is not going to be happy on that so try to make a concerted effort to eat a little bit healthier than you normally would trust me you will thank me for it later. then bring a spare pen a pencil and an eraser to your exam uh, and if not one spare pen then at least two spare pens okay and make sure that your pens work um, before you go into your exam and that your calculator works as well. Make sure your battery is not flat in your calculator. Most calculators have a watch battery, which is pretty common. So most watch manufacturers will be able to help you change your battery if you need to. Okay. And then don't talk to your friends about the exam you are about to write. Okay. Because firstly, they can confuse you. And secondly, it can, it can cause a bit of anxiety. So rather avoid that conversation. Otherwise, you join your friends if they're talking about rage or wherever you're going at the end of the year. Um, but generally speaking, try to avoid the topic of the exam that you're going to write for. And, and that's for any exam that you write. Um, but do form a study group because studying for maths, it's a great way to know that you understand something is to try and explain it to somebody else. So if you can explain it concisely and well to somebody else, then it means that you understand that topic. And, and that you can continue practicing in different topics. And then of course, if you get stuck and you don't understand something, ask for help. Um, we have a Facebook page, Maths Sharp, where you can send questions. I'm always happy to answer them for you and try and help you figure out where you're going wrong and what you need to do. Okay, and then if you are going to an exam, bring a watch with you. If you have one, it will really make it a lot easier than trying to see the time on the giant clock in the front of the hall. Um, and remember, you can't have your cell phone with you, so it's got to be a proper watch, okay, <laughs> old school. Um, <clears throat> and then how you will be tested. So generally, the exam is broken up into four main components, which is knowledge, routine, complex, and then problem solving. So knowledge is your theory questions, and we'll see a lot of the theory and statistics and trigonometry as we go through this paper. Routine is being able to plug something into your calculator and getting a value or factorizing something, which you should have been able to do from grade nine. That's routine. We do it every year. It's the same as always. You know, complex problem solving, you're looking at more of the 2D problems in trigonometry or 3D problems. Um, you're looking at analytical geometry, you're looking at your Euclidean geometry problem solving as well. Okay, so how do you calculate how much time you have for each question? Well, if your exam is 150 marks and you have a total time of three hours, that means you have 180 marks. So that means 180, sorry, 180 minutes. That means you have 180 minutes divided by 150 marks gives you six over five minutes per mark that you have to complete. In other words, one minute 
and one fifth is 12 seconds per mark. Okay, so if you have a section that is 22 marks, then that means you have 26 minutes to complete that section. Okay, so that gives you quite a lot of time, which is why I say bring a watch with you so that you can time yourself and work out how much time you have per section. And also, it will help you not to rush because sometimes you rush a section and, and you miss obvious things. And yes, you want to save time to for the more complex questions that you should be spending more time on. But at the same time, if you don't rush with you, you have three hours, you have nowhere better to be, and you want to get the best result that you possibly can. Okay. Now, when you are sitting down and the exam paper is in front of you, the first thing that you need to do is to read through that exam paper. Okay, mark the questions that you know how to do. Start with those ones first. Calculate how much time you need to spend on each section. If you know that you have one section that's going to be particularly difficult, then maybe give yourself a little bit of extra time from the other sections. Make sure you're comfortable. Wriggle around in your chair. Get comfortable. Make sure someone is not breathing down the back of your neck. Although now with COVID, that's not really a thing. Um, and then once you're about to start your exam, close your eyes. Breathe deeply. <sighs> you know, whistle, and count to 10. It really helps. Uh, I did it before all of my exams when I was writing. It really makes such a big difference. Uh, just to take a moment and breathe. And remember, this does not determine your entire future. It is one exam. You can rewrite it if you apply and, and you know, so don't panic, okay? And then think about something positive that you're going to be doing after the exam. So what is your reward for getting through this exam? Um, are you going to eat a donut? Are you going to have five cups of coffee? Are you going to have a four hour nap? Um, are you going to go see your boo? Whatever. What are you going to do after your exam that's going to make you happy? Okay. <clears throat> right. So I wanted to give you an example of a memo, um, but I chose a poor example. But I wanted to first point out uh, the ores. Do you see here? There's the ore over there. Okay. And that means that you have various ways. And this is maybe not such a great example of an all. And um, if we go and look in the geometry section right at the end, you'll see like four different alls all in a row. Um, we, we have to prove a theorem, they've got four different options. So you really do have a lot of space. Um, you know, th th there's more than one way to, to get to Rome. I'm, I'm mixing metaphors. Okay, and then do you see the ticks? The ticks have a, a reason next to each tick. So your substitution plus your answer. Although here, if you're doing it with a calculator, they're giving you both marks. But generally speaking, there's a mark for uh, substitution, there's a mark for so on. And you know, there's many different ways to get your marks. So make sure that you write down um, all of your working outs. And maybe not so much for statistics, but definitely for... Um, the other stuff. Okay, so let's start with stats. Remember your calculator. Uh, your calculator is your best friend when it comes to statistics, and that is because it will help you get your marks really, really easy. Okay, so remember the steps that you need to take in order to find each statistics value. Then choose the right mode, choose the right statistics mode as well. Check your data and then check it again. Because if you put one value wrong into your calculator, you won't know. Um, and all of your answers will be incorrect. Okay, so just make sure that your data is correct. Go through it, go through it again. When you come back and work through your paper again, check that you've entered the correct answer. And then of course, for stats, you need to know your theory. And I feel like I'm gonna repeat that a lot, but it's true, okay. So question one, a maths teacher uh, was curious to establish if her learner's mathematics marks influenced their physical sciences marks. So in the table below, the maths and physical sciences marks of 15 learners in a class are given as percentages. <clears throat> so here they are. And then, of course, they've drawn a scatter plot with four for you. So you can see that, generally speaking, it's a positive um, linear trend. OK, so let's go look at our first question. So the first question says, determine the equation of the least squares regression line for the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up my calculator. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the stats mode. So mode one for stats. And of course, this is a linear regression equa um, question. So we need to use the option one, which is a plus bx. That's your linear regression. Line. So we're going to press one. Okay. 
Now I'm going to change the way you can see my screen so that you can see the data at the same time as I'm putting it in. So how do we input data? Well, we've got 26 and 34. Those are pairs. So I'm going to enter my data as pairs because it is definitely a safer way to do it. And I'm less, less likely to mix them up. So 34 and equals and then 62 and 67 equals. Then we've got 21 and 28 equals and 33 and 46 equals 53 and 65 equals, let me just move over a little bit more, 76 and 76 equals um, 32 and 26 equals, and let's move across this way, Ooh. so 32 and 26, so 59 and 73 equals, sorry, I'll move it again, <clears throat> 43 and 50 equals 33 and 39 equals and 49 and 57 equals 51 and 51 equals uh, 19 and 24 34 and 41 and 85 and 80. Okay, so there's all of our values. There's 15 learners. So we can just go back up quickly and scroll through our table and check that we've got everything. And once we're happy with that, what we're going to do is we're going to press our change button. Okay, now they've asked us for the linear regression line. So it's very, very easy to do. You're going to press alpha and eight. And all you're going to do is press one for regression value. <clears throat> and there's the formula. And there's what you substitute into the formula. So 9.5 is your y-intercept. And your gradient is 0, comma, and we'll round that off to 9, 1. OK. So that's the formula. And, and that's what they've asked us for. So let's go back to our question and look. So then it says, draw the least squares regression line on the scatter plot provided in the answer. So in your answer book, we've got our little dots. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a straight line. You're gonna use your ruler. And remember your y-intercept is at 9.5. So you're gonna start there and sort of try and go through a couple of dots. That's, that's the main goal. Okay, so just hit, couple of points and there we go and you should get two marks for that so as long as your y-intercept is correct was correct as it can be and then of course that line which is a sort of one-to-one -one ratio okay great then Predict the physical sciences mark of a learner who achieved 69 percent for mathematics now there's two ways to do this Okay, you can either in your calculator use the regression line that you found. So you can say 9.5 plus 0 0.91 times 69, and that will give us 72.29. Okay, so that's what we expect if a, a student got 69 for maths, they should get 72 for science, right? But you can also say, okay, I've got 69, which is my X value, and I'm looking for my Y value. So I'm gonna say second function, and I'm gonna use this button here. You can see in orange, it says Y prime, and that means predict Y when X is 69, and that gives us 72, 2. Okay, which is the same answer as we got just now. So um, that's quite a handy function to have. Now, of course, you can also reverse it. So if I have the Y and I'm looking for X, so I have 72, what is my X value? Then I can say second function and my open brackets button, and it should give me the reverse. Okay, which is if we round it off 69. Okay. <clears throat> Then the next question says, write down the correlation coefficient. So we're going to go back to our um, 
calculator again. And we're just going to go back to that same uh, thing that we were looking at just now with one regression values is R. So our correlation coefficient is 0, 0,95. Okay. Then it says comments on the strength. So 0, 0,95 is really close to one, which means it has a very strong positive correlation between the maths and physical sciences marks. So the next question says, what trend did the teacher observe between the results of the two subjects? Well, um, the higher a student's maths marks, more than likely the higher their physical sciences mark would be as well. Okay. So here's our next question. The number of aircraft landing at the King Shaka International Airport and the Port Elizabeth Airport for periods starting in April 2017 and ending in March 2018 is shown in the double bar graph below. I'm sorry that you can't really see the Port Elizabeth one. <laughs> I tried my best to, to fix it, but it was, it was not the case. Um, so let's look at the questions. So the first question says, the number of aircraft landing at the Port Elizabeth Airport exceeds the number of aircraft landing at the King Shark International Airport during some months of the given period. During which month is this difference the greatest? So we're just gonna go back and look at our graph. Now here we can see mostly King Shark and here Port Elizabeth, and we can see quite clearly that it is in July, 2017, that it had the biggest then the number of aircraft landing at the King Shark International Airport during these months are, and here's all of those, calculate the mean. So again, we're going to use our calculator and we're going to say mode one for stats. And this time we're going to use zero for single data. Okay, so we've got, um, let me change it so that you can see numbers as well. So let's just put those there. 2182 equals 2293 equals 2323 equals 2263 equals um, 2267 equals 2215 equals again 2334 equals and 2271 equals um, 2346 equals 2018 equals, let's go back this way. And then the last one, 2175 equals and 2254 equals. All right, great. So we've got 12 different values there. And if we count them quickly, one, two, three, four, five, six, we've got 12. We can go through and check quickly if all of them are correct. Once we're happy with that, we just press change. Okay. Then to calculate the mean or to find the mean, we just say alpha, we press eight, and we use zero. And there's our number of observations, which is 12, which is correct, and our average, which is 2,245, and we'll just ignore that because you can't have 0 0.8 of an aircraft, so we'll round it down. Okay, the next question says, calculate the standard deviation. So our standard deviation, if we just scroll down our page, is here on sigma x, which is 86.30 or 86,3. Right. <clears throat> So the next question says, determine the number of months in which the number of aircraft landing at the King Shark International Airport were within one standard deviation of the mean. So firstly, um, we need to go back here. Okay, and it's one standard deviation of the mean, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to save the value of the standard deviation. Okay, so to do that, we're going to say alpha RCL, sorry. Alpha 8, having a moment, and we're going to press 2 for variable. And our standard deviation is given as 4. So we're going to press 4. And all we're going to do is store that value into our A. OK. It's just easier to do it this way. You can do it another way. And I'll show you that in a second as well. So we want one standard deviation of the mean. So we're going to go now and find 
just our mean values. So we're going to again use two for variable and one for x bar. And we're going to say minus and our standard deviation, which is A and equals. So the bottom end of our range, let me just write this down, is 2158, right? Or 2159 to round up. Okay. And what we'll then do is just press that, say backspace, and say plus and equals. And our top end of our range is 2331. And we'll round up for that one. Okay. Now, I did say that you could do it another way. So what we can do is just say alpha eight and two for variable, choose our mean, then say minus and alpha eight, two for variable and choose our standard deviation, which is four and same thing. Okay, so it's really up to you how you do it. Um, it's really it's it's really quite easy to to find that without having to write down all of the values. Although you still do need to write them down anyway. So there you go. Okay, so to get back to our question, um, there we are. So they're asking how many months are between the, the uh, 2158, so I'm gonna write it here. So we've got 2158 and we've got 2331 is our top. Okay, <clears throat> so this one is bigger than and uh, this one and less than that one. So we can circle it. This one is also between those two values. This one is between those two values. This one is between those two values. Yes, yes, no, and yes, and no, and no, uh, yes, and Yes. So we're going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there are nine months where the um, number of aircrafts are within one standard deviation of the mean. Cool. <clears throat> then it says, which of the following statements is correct? So during December and January, there were more landings at the Port Elizabeth Airport than the King Shark International Airport. So that's really easy to check. We'll just go look on our graph and we'll see, okay, between December and January, well, actually King Shark was more than uh, Port Elizabeth. So point A is not true. Okay. Then it says there was greater variation in the number of aircraft landing at the King Shark International Airport than at Port Elizabeth Airport for the given period. So again, we're just going to go back and look at our graph. And we can see actually King Shark is relatively stable. It's got quite a small um, range of values. So the variation, and you can see with Port Elizabeth that it's quite a substantial, bit, uh, quite a bit bigger range. So we can see that King Shaka has less variation than Port Elizabeth. So if we go back and look, there is a greater variation. So no, that is also not true. So by default, C must be true, but we can check. So it says the standard deviation of the number of landings of Port Elizabeth Airport will be higher than the standard deviations of the number of landings of the King Shark International Airport, which is in fact the reverse statement of what this is saying because variation and standard deviation are linked by squared value. So if your variation is higher, so is your standard deviation. Okay, so your answer is obviously C. Cool, any questions on stats? We're all good. Fantastic, okay, let's hit analytical geometry. Okay, so I said know your formulae and know your theory, know them. Um, really important. Again, the formulas are on your formula sheet, but know which what belongs with what, okay? And then of course, practice analytical geometry um, because you might be surprised by the questions that you get. So it's always a good idea to get as much varied practice as you possibly can um, around each of the sets of questions that you're going to do, okay? And then analytical geometry is quite a nice, well, I found it a, a nice pleasant section. Uh, Euclidean geometry always made me cry. <laughs> but these are really nice. They're, they're nice questions, generally speaking, as long as you know your theory. Okay. And then remember, parallel lines, your gradients are equal. In other words, uh, your gradients are the same. And with perpendicular lines, your gradient one times gradient two is equal to negative one. 
So if they tell you your lines are perpendicular, you know that that um, statement about your gradients is the case. And if they ask you to prove that a line is perpendicular, then what you would do is multiply the gradients and see if it gives you negative one. If it does, then you know that your gradients are, or your lines are perpendicular. And then of course, remember the magical tan theta is equal to your gradients. Okay. So <clears throat> question three. Um, triangle TSK is shown. Uh, the equation ST is y is equal to half x plus six. Because while I love stats, um, I just want to make sure that I'm not going quite great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so ST cuts the x axis at m, and W negative four and four lies on ST and R lies on SK such that WR is parallel to the Y axis. So that's very important because it means that the R X coordinate is also negative four. Okay. Then <clears throat> WK cuts the Y axis at B and the, uh, sorry, the X axis at B and the Y axis at P is zero and negative four. K is produced cuts. So when they say K is produced, that means they extended the line further using the same line, cuts the x-axis at n and it gives you beta there and t s k is equal to beta. All right, so it says calculate the gradients of w, p. So our gradients, here's w, here's p, we've got both coordinates. So it's very simple just to plug it into our gradient formula, right, which is, um, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if I use 4 as my y2, and uh, that will be my x2 minus minus. And then here I've got negative 4. And here I've got 0. And we can just chuck this into the calculator quickly. So, oh, just, um, I'm just going to press home. And then we've got negative four minus negative four over uh, negative four sorry <clears throat> that's positive four uh, negative four minus zero which we don't have to put in but we'll put it in anyway and that gives us negative two so the gradients of um, wp is negative two. Now write that down because we're going to need it. Okay, then it says show that WP is perpendicular to SG. So remember that thing where I said that a line is perpendicular when your gradients multiply to be minus one. That's what we're going to use. So we have ST, which is um, a half. Okay, and there's our gradient, which is a half. And we know WP's gradient, which is negative two. So a half times negative two gives me negative one. And therefore my gradients are, uh, sorry, my lines are perpendicular, which is what we've proved now. Okay. If the equation of SK is given as five Y plus two X plus 60 is equal to zero, calculate the coordinates of S. So let's go look, S is there. We've got the line ST. They've just given us the line SK. So we're gonna solve this simultaneously. So uh, let me draw a picture. <clears throat> right, so we've got the other line, which is y is equal to a half x plus six, right? Um, so we can just call this one and this equation here two, and we're going to substitute one into two. Okay, so what we're gonna have is five times half an x plus six plus 60 is equal to zero. So we've got five over two x plus five times six is 30 plus 60 is equal to zero. 30 and 60 make 90 and we're gonna take each other's side becomes negative 90 and this side oh, I've missed plus two x, I'm so sorry. And then we'll add the x's together, five over two x plus two x. So five over two is two and a half. 
plus two gives me four and a half x, right? And then we divide both sides by four and a half. So x is equal to negative 20. Okay, then once we've got our x, we can substitute it back into our y. So we're going to have, <clears throat> sorry, I just want to change my um, mouse pad here. So y is equal to a half times negative 20 plus 6, right? So that gives us a half times negative 20 is negative 10 plus just 6 um, gives us negative 4. So our S coordinate, which we'll write down in full, is negative 20 and negative 4. Okay. Great. Fantastic. All right. Let me clear this away. And let's move on to the next question. Now, the next question says, calculate the length of WR, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at what is WR. So WR is this length here, right? So we know that the X coordinate of R is negative four because it is parallel to the Y axis, okay? So we can substitute negative four into our line SK, which was given to us over here, and we can find the value of Y. Okay, so we've got uh, 5Y plus 2 times negative 4 plus 60 is equal to 0, right? And then we've got 5Y is equal to minus 8 plus 60 is equal to zero. So this here is gonna be 52 and we're gonna take it to the side. So it's gonna be negative 52. And we've got five y left on the side. Now we both divide both sides by five. So we've got y is equal to negative and five goes into 50 10 times with the remainder of two over five. Okay. Then the length, Right, so I'm, I'm just going to clear this away. So just make a note of ten, negative 10 and 2 thirds. Okay, <clears throat> and let's go back to our picture. Sorry, it's calculating WR. So here's W, which is sitting at a Y value of 4. And here's R, which is sitting at a value, a uh, Y value of negative 10 and 2 fifths. And the distance will obviously just be 4 plus, well, four minus, minus 10 and two fifths. So that gives us a total of 14 and two fifths. Then this question, calculate the size of theta. So we're gonna go back and look at our picture again. And I just wanna show you here quickly. So if we bring down our x-axis, okay? So we're just gonna bring a line that's parallel to the x-axis. I apologize. Um, actually, let me use my straight line because that would be much easier to see. Um, I'm discovering new things on Zoom all the time. It is very exciting. Okay, pretend my line is straight. Okay, so <laughs> what we, what you can see is you've got one angle there, uh, which is your ST, and one angle here, which is your SK reference angle. So the SK reference angle will call theta 2, and this one will call theta 1. Okay, so ST uh, is theta 1, and this one is uh, theta 2. Okay, so let's clear that away, and we're going to go back and work where I have space. <clears throat> so we've got our theta 1, which is linked to ST and ST's line, our gradient is equal to a half. So we're just gonna plug that into our calculator uh, and we're just gonna say inverse tan, so second function, second function tan and we're gonna put in a half and it's gonna give us 26,56. So I'm going to change the way that you see my screen so that we can draw. Okay, so we've got theta one is equal to 26 comma, oh geez, it's fighting with me today, uh, 57. Okay, then the other one 
which is SK, our line was given to us as um, 5y plus 2x plus 60y. So we don't actually have the gradient straight off that. So we have to go and make y by itself. So we're going to have y, 5y is equal to negative 2x plus, uh, minus 6. Okay. Then we divide everything by 5. So we've got y is equal to negative 2 over 5. Um, x and 60 divided by 5 is 12. So our gradient here is negative 2 fifths. Okay, so we can again just put out it into our tan. So we're going to have second function tan, and we're going to just put in 2 fifths and equals, and we get 21, 8. So that's theta 2, right? So theta 2 is equal to 21 comma 8. And then of course, we just add the two together, which gives us a total of our ginormous theta, which gives us 48 comma 37. Now I haven't structured this beautifully. I mean, I've left some of the writing out that you need to do, but you can sort of follow my logic um, along with what I'm doing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, then it says, let L be the points in the third quadrant such that SWRL in that order forms a parallelogram. Okay, so calculate the area of swirl. I like, I like calling it swirl, but you, you know, SWRL. Okay, so the area of a parallelogram is equal to its base times its perpendicular height. Okay, and here because this line is perpendicular here to um, this line that runs through S, okay, and we have S which was negative 20 and negative 4, and we have this line here where your X is negative 4, we can find our perpendicular height. <clears throat> so our height is going to be uh, negative 4 uh, minus minus 20. So our height is going to be 16. Okay, and remember, it must always be a positive number of units. It can never be negative. And then our base will be this WR, which we found just now, which was 14 and 2 fifths. So our area is just going to be 16 times 14 and two fifths. And if we plug that into the calculator, which we won't do because then we'll lose everything, <laughs> we will get a value of 230 and comma four over there. Okay, so that's a very quick, very basic um, area of your parallelism. Okay, so that's, they're using measurements here, which is the area of a parallelogram. Um, and of course, remembering your knowledge about parallel lines being, or lines that run parallel to your y-axis as well. Right, question four. <clears throat> so M negative three and four is the center of a large circle and a point on the small circle having a center at zero and zero. From N is negative 11 and P, a tangent is drawn to touch the large circle at t. So what this actually is telling you is, oh, sorry, we haven't read that, with nt is parallel to the y-axis. So because this is parallel to the y-axis, it means that our x value at t is also going to be negative 11. Okay. Then it says nm is a tangent, so we know a tangent is perpendicular to a radius. Um, and mos is the diameter which we'll also use in a little bit. So lots of important information. I didn't cross that out as highlighting it. Lots of important information here. <clears throat> Sorry, this is supposed to be 4.1. Determine the equation of the small circle. So that's pretty straightforward. We know our circle formula is x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Okay, so what we're going to do is substitute in our x and our um, y on this 
circumference of our circle. So we're going to have negative 3 squared plus that 4 squared is equal to r squared. So that becomes 9. That is 16. So r squared is equal to 25. So our formula, which we must write at the end, is x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. Okay. Great. Then the next question says, determine the equation of the circle centered at M in the form of X is negative, um, X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared is equal to, sorry, that should be R squared. Okay, so here we've got X minus, oh, sorry. Um, so we've got X, uh, minus minus three becomes plus three. And we've got y minus four is equal to r squared. Okay, then we know that the t coordinate here, which is gonna be negative 11, has got a y value um, over here, which is perpendicular because this is a tangent to the circle as well. Um, is going to be four. So we're just going to substitute those both in. So it's negative 11 plus three squared plus, and then this will be four and minus four is equal to r squared. So that becomes negative eight squared, and that becomes zero. So we'll just leave it out is equal to r squared. So r squared is equal to 64. So our formula is then x plus three squared plus y minus four squared is equal to 64. Okay. So then it says determine the equation of nm in the form y is equal to mx plus c. So nm is this line here. So the only information we really have that we can use is negative three and four. We don't know what n is. And of course we know that this is the diameter. So to find the value of s, what we do is we know that it's been rotated 180 degrees, right? So this value here is going to be three and negative four. Okay, then we can use that to find, oh, in fact, this is just zero here. I'm being very silly. So you can just get the gradient using zero and zero. Um, so our gradients of MO is going to be um, four and negative three minus minus zero and zero. So we have a gradient of four over negative three. And then because our radius is perpendicular to our tangent, then this gradient of uh, M N is just going to be three over four because we're just dividing negative one by this value here. Okay, once we've got that, we can say y is equal to three over four x uh, plus c and we substitute in our m to find our c value. Okay, so your final answer, um, I'm not going to do the whole calculation because it's very straightforward, should be uh, six and a, so it'll be y is equal to three quarters x uh, plus six and a quarter or uh, 25, however you like writing it. Okay. Then it says calculate the length of SM. Okay, that's why you actually need to find the <clears throat> coordinates. Okay. So as I said, as I'm, wow, I'm having a moment. As I mentioned just now, this is going to be uh, three and negative four because of that rotation value then we've got to find the length of Sn. So we need to find the p-value of Rn, which is quite easy because all we'll do is substitute negative 11 into the straight line that we just found, right? So uh, I'm not gonna do that, but the answer here is negative two. So once you've got those two coordinates, we can just use our distance formula for Sn, which is square root, um, x2 uh, minus x1 squared plus 
y2 minus y1 squared. And so we can chuck that all into our calculator. So we're going to have, um, so we're going to have square roots and then we've got our x, so negative 11 minus three and close bracket squared. And then we've got plus and we've got um, our y value there was negative two and our other y value was negative four and squared and equals and it gives us 10 square root 2 and if we change it 14 comma 1 4. <clears throat> if another circle with the center b negative 2 and 5 and radius k touches the circle center at m determine the values of k correct to one decimal place okay so hint hint one so we've got a point B, which is somewhere over here, which is negative two and five. And then we've got a circle, which either has a radius big enough to reach here, like so, or it's really big and it reaches down below. Okay, so that shift in, in size of the radius is going to be the size of the diameter radius of M plus or minus this shift between the two, okay? So we need to find the distance of BM, right? So we can just quickly chuck that into the calculator. Again, using our distance formula. So we're going to have, um, we've got negative three minus negative two squared. I'm missing a, there we go. Um, plus, and then we've got four minus five squared. And so the answer is square root two. So the value of K that we're going to have is going to be your radius, which is eight, which is the square root of 64. So K is equal to, eight plus square root two, or k is equal to eight minus square root two. And then of course, we can solve that using the calculator and it will give us two values. Um, two, uh, one decimal place. So let's just do it quickly. Um, so we've got eight minus square root two, is equal to and change six comma six. Remember to round it off. And we've got plus square root two, and that gives us nine comma rounded off to four. Great. Uh, any questions so far? We're all cozy, comfortable, ready for more. Okay, fantastic. Remember, you can pop your questions into the chat function as well. So things to remember. <clears throat> remember what each thing does on your graph. Now, they'll never ask it with all of these things, but it is good to know your theory. So A is your amplitude. It's the size of your wave. B is the frequency, which is how many you're squeezing into your period, which is 360. This is your shift left and right. And of course, Q is your shift up and down. And then of course, remember your cast diagram. It's a wonderful thing. You're going to use it a lot in trigonometry questions. Know your theory. Your double and compound angles. Yes, they are on the formula sheets. And in fact, I just copied them across from the formula sheets into our question paper here. Um, but this one here, sine squared LA, plus cos squared A equals to one is not on your formula sheet. So you need to learn this one off by heart and they will always use it. Just trust me on this, okay. So <clears throat> the first question is the graphs of F of X is equal to negative a half cos X and G of X sine X plus 30. So when it's X plus 30, it means X is equal to negative 30. So it was shifted to the left. 
for the interval x is uh, X is an element of between 0 and 180 are drawn below. Then A, which is 130,9 and 0, 0,33, is the approximate point of intersection of the two. So here's some theory questions for you. Write down the period of G. G is a sine graph, so your period is simply 360. Write down the amplitude of F, well, we can see it from our equation, our amplitude is a half, the size of a wave, or half a wave, should I say. Determine the value of f of negative 180 minus g of 180. So we can go and sort of try and guess on our graph, but we can also just chuck it into the calculator. So yeah, I'm just going to do it very quickly. So we've got... Um, Yeah, so you can actually see. So we've got negative a half uh, cos, and then we've got 180 equals half, right? So we'll just say the first one is f is equal to a half, and g we'll do is here it is. So we've got sine and 180 plus 30 is equal to negative a half. So g is equal to negative a half, right? So we've got f minus g. So we've got half minus minus a half. So our answer is equal to Okay, so those are your theory questions. Very, very easy and straightforward. Okay, so then it says, use the graphs to determine the values um, of x in the interval x is for which. Then it's, they've shifted both of these 10 degrees to the right because x is equal to plus 10, right? So if we go look on our graph, we are here where they are equal to each other and they've shifted them to the right by 10 degrees. So your x value is simply going to be 140,9. Then I'm not going to lie to you, the second one stumped me a bit. So what they're actually looking at is if you think about it, these are two of the graphs, right? But they don't look like they originally do because they're saying use the graphs. So how can we make cos look like it's, its original graph? Well, we can multiply it by, oh, sorry, a half. Okay, so we, because we're doing that to this one, we have to do it to all of them. So we're going to have square root 3 over 2 and uh, sine x. And then we're going to have a half cos x is greater than a half, right? Now, this here and this here are both special angles. So cos of square root 3 over 2 is uh, cos. 30, right? So we can have cos 30 times sine x plus, and this becomes sine 30. So there's your special angles uh, times cos x is greater than or equal to a half. And this is a double angle. So now we can simplify it to say sine x plus 30. Hmm, interesting, is greater than a half, which is actually our um, f of x graph. Uh, sorry, our g of x graph, right? So what we're going to do is we're going, I'm just going to clear here so you can actually see um, on the picture. We're going to go look for where it's greater than uh, a half, right? And we can see at zero, it's a half, and approximately here at 120, it would be a half. So your values greater than a half are between x. So zero is less than x is less than 120. Now, I do want to show you something because I think it's, it's something that will help in the exam. So I'm just going to show you. So what I did is I went to my table mode because I love table mode. And if I can't figure something out, I will put it into table mode. Okay. So I took square root 3 uh, sine x plus 
and cos x, right? And you can either bring the one to the other side and make it minus one, okay? And then in which case we're looking for values greater than zero, or you can leave it on that side, in which case we're looking for values greater than one. So I'm going to bring it this side because finding values greater than uh, zero is easier to see. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my step five just for speeding things up a little bit. And you can see immediately that at zero, it's zero. So when x is zero, it's zero. And then it becomes greater than zero, right? So from zero, and then we just scroll through the table very quickly. We can see it's all positive and we're looking for where it changes to negative. So it stops at 120, which is what we found in the question. But it's a really quick, easy way uh, to check that we're on the right track. And if you can't figure this out, you don't know what they're doing, then at least go to your table mode and get one or two marks for at least getting part of the answer correct. Okay. <clears throat> so question six, in the diagram, uh, P negative five and two, uh, sorry, and 12, and T lies on the positive X axis. And then your angle POT is given as theta. Then it says, answer the following without using a calculator. And um, I said earlier, it hurts my feelings, but I'm just joking. <laughs> you, need, you do need to do some maths without a calculator, but we're going to use it anyway. Um, so it says, write down the value of 10. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, remember, um, you, you learned this rhyme right in the beginning in grade 10 when we started learning. Um, so we've got, you are excellent. Are you excellent? Um, I have written it down wrong. I'm so sorry. Just erase all of this. Okay, let's try that again. So you are excellent. Are you excellent? Okay, so tan is equal to y over x, which we have. We've got the y and we've got the x. So tan theta is simply going to be 12 over negative five. Very easy. You really didn't need a calculator for that. Okay. So really what they want you to do is not solve the theta when they're asking questions like this. Okay. Then let's go look. The next question says calculate the value of cos theta. So now we know, well, we just wrote it down, that cos is u r excellent r. So cos is x over r, but we don't have r. How do we find r? Well, we use our theorem of Pythagoras and we find r. Okay, so our theorem of Pythagoras says r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So we just substitute in. So it's negative five squared plus 12 squared. So we've got um, 25 plus 144 is equal to 169. And if we square root that, r is equal to 13. Okay. so our cos theta is going to be um, x, which is negative 5 over 13. OK, not so bad, right? <clears throat> so now I just want to show you another shortcut, which is super handy to know um, and to check your answer. So what you can do on your calculator is just to type in your x and y coordinates. So we have negative 5 and x comma y bracket button like we used for stats and then 12 and we say second function and eight and that gives us r is y well, hypotenuse is 13 and theta which is that angle is 112 degrees okay so again it's, it's just something to know um, and to check your answers with as well then here it says s um, a b is a point on the third quadrant such that the angle of TOS, which is this angle here. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me pull up my pen so that I don't do that. So this whole angle is theta plus 90 degrees. And this length here is 6,5 units. Then it says calculate the value of B. So this is there. Now, I like to draw pictures um, because it helps. So <laughs> if all else fails, draw a picture so you can see what's going on. Okay, so all they've done is they've just shifted it around a little bit. So this line, this line here is not there anymore. Okay, so we can see we've got um, 
uh, an angle, right? Which we'll um, do over there, okay. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this length and we're looking for the B value, which is this one here, right? It's the Y value. So we've got um, opposite over hypotenuse, right? So that is sine. So we're gonna say sine of 90 plus theta is equal to, and then we've got opposite, which is B, over our length, which is six comma five, right? Now sine 90 plus theta, if we think about our cast diagram, um, just falls into this quadrant here. So it doesn't change any signs. So it just becomes a cos theta is equal to B over 6.5. But we just found cos theta. We found it to be negative five over 13, right? Now we can easily solve for B. So we can see from 13 to six and a half, we divided by two. So all we're gonna do to the five is divided by two. So B is gonna be equal to negative five over two. And there you go, that's it. So yes, it might look complicated in the beginning, but give it a try and you, you might surprise yourselves. All right, then it says, determine without calculus, uh, um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the value of the following trigonometric. I mean, sorry, so you can't put this in the calculator. So I've, you can see that I've just copied your double angles across because we didn't have them. And so obviously the sign is pretty straightforward. You only have one option. So we're just going to say sign two. And then remember, it's x, not whatever the letter is that they've used here. So use the same letters as x times. And then let's draw our cost diagram as well. Okay, so we've got cos negative x, which is over here. So that just makes it a positive. So you're just gonna have cos x, and then we've got plus and cos squared x. So I'm gonna look through, and I can see I've got two coses on this side. So I'm gonna look for a cos squared, which I'm gonna use over here. So that's gonna be a two cos squared x minus one, and then I've got 360 minus x, which is also down here, which is negative. So I'm gonna change my sign in front to a negative and have sine x over here, all over. And then I've got 180 plus x, which is over here in this quadrant here, which again is not a positive sign, it's a negative sign. So I'll have negative sine x, okay. Then we can simply simplify. So here I'm just going to multiply them together. So I've got two sine x times, and there's two causes. So it's going to be cos squared x minus, and then we're going to multiply these out. So I've got two cos squared x times sine x, and minus times minus is a plus, and then it's just going to be plus sine x over there, all over. Sorry about my lines and negative sine x, don't forget your sign. <clears throat> so here we can see that these two are exactly the same. Even though the cos and the sine switched around or in different orders, it's still a cos squared x and a sine x. So it's like saying um, sine x y squared and sine, sorry, at uh, 2y x squared and 2xy, at uh, 2x squared y. Okay, same, same. So these two, because they are identical, cancel because of the minus sign in the middle. So you've actually just got a sine x over negative sine x, which gives us a beautiful negative one. Okay, so remember, pull up your, your theorems, um, your formula sheets. In fact, you can pull off the back sheet, which is your formula sheet, and use it um, with you. Okay. I know so I, I know I say learn your formulas <laughs> and do, but if you're stuck, go to the formula sheet and look. Okay, then this one says determine the general solution of the following equation. And we have this horrendous looking thing and six marks, and we think, oh my goodness me. But this is really quite straightforward because we've got a sine squared, we've got a singular cos, and we've got a negative three. And we know from our theory that we've learned that's not on the formula sheet that sine squared plus cos squared is equal to one. 
So sine squared is equal to one minus cos squared, which we can simplify, which we can substitute in here. So we will have six times one minus cos squared uh, in place of sine squared. And then we'll just write the rest. Okay, and then let's write it all out. So we've got six minus six cos squared x plus seven cos x minus three is equal to zero and we'll simplify. So we've got negative six cos squared x plus seven cos x. And we've got six minus three, which becomes plus three is equal to zero. Now this looks like a trinomial, but with causes. So we can pretend, just go with me here, that the causes are actually k's. So if we look at it as six uh, k squared, minus 7k, I've just, I'm taking out the sign of a negative, right? Minus three, that's a trinomial. And we can factorize that quite simply, right? So we'll write down our factors of six, which are one and six and two and three. And we'll write down our factors of three, which are one and three and three and one. And we'll do our cross multiplication. So one times three is three, and six times one is six, and that does not give me seven. Sorry, let me just rewrite this so that it does not confuse us when we trying to solve at the end here. Okay, so we're looking for, we've got a negative and a negative, which means different signs, okay. Then we've got one times one is one and three times three is nine. So that's also not gonna give us eight because nine and one make, sorry, nine and one make eight, which doesn't give us seven. So that's not gonna work. So we can ignore this one. And I'm just gonna erase these so that we can do it again. Okay, so two times three is six and three times one is three and that gives us three, so that doesn't work. Two times one is two and three times three is nine and nine minus two gives us seven. So those are our values there. So now all we're gonna do is we're going to write two instead of K, we're gonna write cos X um, and a three over here. And we've got a three cos x um, and a one. And then of course this, it must be a negative and this must be a plus because negative nine plus two gives me minus seven is equal to zero. Now, if we try and solve this one, we'll get cos x is equal to three over two, which is impossible. If you try and, and figure it out on the calculator, you'll get an error. So what we do is we write, not applicable. Okay, then for this one, we get um, cos x is equal to negative one over three, which we can solve. And so we're going to do that. I'm just going to clear my screen first. Okay, so from the top, we've got cos x is equal to negative one over three, right? That's where we are. Now, <clears throat> from this, we're going to use our calculator and we're going to get a reference angle. And that angle is going to be 70 comma, hang on. Uh, second function cos one third, 70 comma five three. Okay, but because it's negative, we've got to now say 180 minus, 70,53. So our actual x value or x reference angle is going to be 180 minus 70,53, which gives us 109,47 degrees. Now it's asking us for the general solution. So that means they want more than just a reference angle. They want two options. Okay, so you have option one, which is your reference angle 109,47 degrees plus K360. And then if we look at our cast diagram, the other place where it is positive is here in the C quadrant, in the fourth quadrant. So we're gonna have X is equal to 360 minus 109,47 plus K360. And if we simplify that, it's 250 comma 53 degrees plus K3C. 
16. So you can see there was quite a lot of work that you had to do for your six months. But in actual fact, it was a bit of algebra, and a little bit of trigonometry, and it was a fun question. So don't panic when you see something like that. Um, think about it and see what it looks like. Okay. Then here, it says, given <clears throat> x plus 1 over x is equal to 3 cos k, and x squared plus 1 over x squared is equal to 2, determine the value of cos 2a without using a calculator. Marvelous. So first, you don't have any reference, so you couldn't use a calculator if you never wanted to try. That is always fun. Um, so we've got here x plus 1 over x is equal to 3 cos a, right? So this is the only thing with cos in it. And we can see here that our reference with cos a, uh, with cos 2a is that we need a squared. Okay, so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to square both of these. Okay, so on this side, it, the x squared becomes well, x squared, and 1 over x squared becomes 1 over x squared. And then don't get your middle term, which says um, this one times this one times two. I call it the Mickey D's rule. If you were with me on paper one, it's called the Mickey D's rule, okay? And basically, it means this one times this one, which is one times two, which is two, is equal to, and three squared is nine, and then you've got cos squared a. Right? So this value here, x squared plus 1 over x squared, is actually equal to 2. So we can substitute that in. So we've got 2 plus 2 is equal to 9 cos squared a, right? So this is 4 is equal to 9 cos squared a. So let's get cos squared by itself. So we're going to divide this by 9. Okay. Now, it's simply using our rule, okay? So our rule says we've got cos 2a is equal to 2 cos squared a minus 1. So we've got cos squared a, which is 4 over 9. So I'm just going to do bad maths and put it all in the same line. So we can have 2 times 4 over 9 minus one, right? And two times four over nine is eight over nine. And eight over nine minus one leaves us with minus one, nine. And then we have found the value of cos 2a, sadly, without using, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> without using a calculator. Okay. <clears throat> so this is question seven. How are we feeling? Are we good? Any questions? Let's go back to my notes because it hits trigonometry. I mean, sorry, geometry soon. Okay, so <clears throat> the landscape artist plants uh, plans to plant um, flowers within two con concentric circles around a vertical light pole P. Okay, Q. R is a point uh, on the inner circle. And S is a point on the outer circle. And R, Q, and S lie in the same horizontal plane on the floor. RS is a pipe used for the irrigation system. That's this one here. It's a beautiful story. The radius of the inner circle is R units, which we can see on the diagram. And the radius of the outer circle um, is QS. So that's an important piece of information. The angle of elevation from S to P is 30 units. And the angle is 2x and PQ is square root 3 times R. Now, the first question says, show that QS is equal to 3R. So here's QS. We don't have enough information in this bottom triangle to help us. But we do have a right angle triangle with an angle and a side. So we can see that we've got an opposite and we've got an adjacent. So that other rhyme that you learned is either Sokotoa or O Hell another hour of algebra. Okay, apologies for my skewness. Okay, so we can see we've got opposites and adjacent, which means we've got tan. So we're going to say tan 30 is equal to uh, opposite, which is square root 3 or over QS, which is what we're looking for. Okay, so we bring QS to the other side. Okay, and then we 
divide by tan 30. So we have square root three r divided by tan 30. So what we can do is ignoring the r, we can plug the rest of this into our calculator, which is what I'm going to do now. We're gonna lose all of this, so please forgive me. So we'll have, um, we'll have square root three over tan 30, and that will give us three. So what we've got left, um, I jump the gun here a little bit. What we've got left is um, QS is equal to three. And we had left over R and we've just proved what they asked us to prove. Okay. Then the next question says, determine in terms of R, the area of the flower garden. So we've got the area of the flower garden is actually just this piece over here. Okay. So we need to find the area of the inner circle and the area of the outer circle and subtract the one from the other. Okay, so we're going to have the area of the inner circle is just pi r squared. And the area of the outer circle we know is 3r, right? So it's going to be 9r squared. So 9r squared minus r squared gives us 8 pi r squared. Okay. Then show that rs is equal to r square root 10 minus 6 cos 2x. And I've shown you the rule. So all you would need to do is say, okay, a is going to be my rs value. Um, and we can see it from the diagram. So let me go back here. Um, we can see from the diagram that we've got two sides and an included angle. And the only rule that works with that one is obviously our cos rule, which is why I copied and pasted it here. <laughs> okay, so that's why we chose. And of course, this also gives us a big hint um, for which rule to use because it's telling us cos in the um, answer as well. So what you do is just substitute each of these. I'm not gonna do it now because it's pretty straightforward um, and it's already quite late. So I wanna move on to other questions as well. Okay, then if r is 10 meters and x is 56, that's as simply as substituting in to this equation that they've already given us and finding r s. So just use your calculator uh, to find that. Okay, Euclidean geometry. Learn your geometry theorems. They are very important, okay? Uh, <clears throat> especially your grade 11 uh, theorems. Bring colored pens with you, pencils, highlighters. Trust me, it will help. Okay, that's the way I, I did my geometry. Um, and if I, I must confess to you that I flunked my metric paper two in June and I managed to get an A at the end of the year. Uh, so all from studying and practicing and figuring out where I went wrong. So it's, it's definitely possible. Don't give up, okay? Um, so we did actually a workshop with Kevin Smith who writes the Handbook and Study Guide textbooks, a wonderful teacher. Um, so if you are stuck with Euclidean geometry, this is a great video to go and watch. It revises all of the grade 11 um, geometry theorems as well. Okay. Then go through your diagram and see what you can see. Use the information that they give you at the top of the question to answer the questions that have been asked. And then of course, learn your similarity and ratio, which I feel is actually easier than grade 11 geometry. Okay, so very quickly, O is the center of the circle, KOM bisects a chord. So we, as soon as we see something bisecting a chord where O is the center, that means your radius is bisecting a chord, which means it's perpendicular. And then of course, MNO is 26 degrees, K and P are points on the circle with in KP equal to 32 degrees and OP is drawn. So here we've actually got a radar, a radar and a, another radar and a, another radar, just for future reference. Okay, so mark your radar. They are also really important as well. Okay, so it says determine giving reasons the size of angle O2. So if we go look, angle O2 is that one there. And it's quite straightforward. We can just see the angle at center is twice the angle at the circumference. So angle O2 is going to be 54 degrees. 
Okay. Then <clears throat> the next one is angle O1, which is this one here. So we know that this is 90 degrees and this is 26. So we can find O3, okay, which gives us a value of 64 degrees as well. And then if we take the line and we say 180 minus 64 minus 64, we get a value of 5201. You can do it another way. There are different ways to do it, but um, that was just the one that I came up with. Okay, so then it says, sorry, we didn't actually read that question, prove giving reasons that Kn bisects OKP. So Kn is this line here, bisects OKP. In other words, they want us to prove that K1 is equal to K2. Okay, so we've got this angle here, which is 52. And then of course, we wrote down that these are radii, which means this whole angle is equal to this whole angle. And we have that this is 52 degrees, right? So we can say 180 minus 52 will give us 128. So each angle is 128 divided by two, which is 64. Now this is 32, so 64 minus 32 gives us 32, and that proves that angle K1 is equal to angle K2. Then we've got in triangle ABC, F and G are points on sides A, B, and AC respectively. D is a point on GC such that D1 is equal to angle B. So the question says, uh, if AF is a tangent to the circle passing through the points F, G, and D, then prove giving reasons that F, G is parallel to BC. So again, like I said, I like to draw pictures. It really helps me see what's going on. And we can see here that AB is a tangent at the point F, right? We can also see that the tan chord theorem says that F1 is equal to D1, right? So from there, we are given that D1 is equal to B, which means that B and F1 are equal, right? But they can only be equal if these lines are parallel, because these are corresponding angles. So we have proved that FG is now parallel to BC. It is further given that AF is equal to two over five and um, AC, oh, sorry, AF over FB is equal to two over five. AC is equal to 2x minus 6, and GC is equal to x plus 9, then calculate the value of um, x, right? So we can see that if we look at our triangle, we've got AF over FB, which is what they gave us, and we've got AG, which we haven't got, but we've got AC, and we've got GC. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna instead use this one. I'm so sorry, that was crazy. Uh, we're gonna use this one here and this one, and we're gonna use this one here and this one. Okay, so we're gonna say um, AF, sorry, not AF, AB, um, let's do the short, it doesn't matter, over FB is equal to, um, we said the long one first, so AC over GC, right? Now, we're given a ratio that um, I've now lost. This is on the next page. So we're given a ratio of AF and FB. Okay, so all we have to do to get um, AB is to add the two of them together, which is gonna give us seven, right? So we're gonna have seven over five, Okay, is equal to, and then we've got AC, which is 2x uh, minus 6, and this one, which is x plus 9. And then it's as simple as cross multiplying and solving for x, and that is grade 9 routine procedure work. Okay, so I'm not going to cover that now. Um, you should be able to do that um, on your own. If you are watching on YouTube, you can simply pause the video and try it on your own as well.
Now, question nine says, in the diagram, um, O is a little circle and points S, T and R lie on the circle, cause S, T, R, S, R and T, R are drawn in the circle. Q, S is a tangent to the circle at S. Use the diagram to prove the theorem, which states that Q, S, T is equal to angle R. Okay, so they're actually asking you to prove the tan chord theorem. So what we're gonna do is I took this from the answer book. So this is actually the first one that they used. So what they did is they drew in the diameter. So you would have to say construct diameter um, is okay. And so we know that an angle um, on the diameter is 90 degrees, right? This one here. And we also know that the radius or diameter by um, is perpendicular to a tangent. So we can see that these two are 90 degrees, right? Then we've also got a beautiful butterfly, which means that this one here is equal to this one here. Okay, and that's angles in the same segments. And therefore, because they're both 90 and that one and that one are equal, it means that this one here and this one here are equal. And therefore, our theorem is proved that says QST is equal to angle R. So that's just simply um, learning your theorem um, off by heart. Okay. <clears throat> then we've got chord QN bisects angle MNP. So over there, so these two are equal. And, um, and intersects called MP at uh, S. Okay. The tangent at P meets MN produced at R such that QN is parallel to PR. Let P1 equal X. Okay. So then the question says determine the following angles in terms of X given reason. So angle N2 first. So here we can see that it is just a tan chord theorem, very straightforward. And in fact, not even, you don't even need to use that. You can use alternating angles. Um, so because these two are parallel. So P1 is equal to N2. Then the next one we've got is Q2, right? So we can, we know that this one is equal to that one. Yes. And we know that we've got angles in the same segment. So that one's equal, right? And we've got radii. Well, we actually don't know if that's a radar, so we can't use that one. So we've got, um, I have, I'm having a moment. Oh, sorry. So we've actually got the tan chord theorem here. That's why I was actually using it. Uh, so this angle here is equal to P1 because of the tan chord theorem. And you can see if you draw the line across and down, it works out to um, tan chord. All right, then prove giving reasons uh, that MN over NR is equal to MS over SQ. So when I looked at this question and I was putting in the colorful lines, I thought, what has happened to the triangle? But actually, what they really want is you can see that this is your parallel uh, lines triangle where you have your, your triangle in this portion, right? So what you've got is actually MS over SP. So they want you to prove that SQ is equal to SP. Right, so we've so far got that this is X, this is X, this is X, right? And we need to prove that P3 is also X. And we can do that because we have um, ang angles in uh, same segment. So this is X over here. And because these two are equal, it means that your triangle is an isosceles triangle and therefore the sides are equal. So SP is equal to SQ and you have prove that ratio. Okay, I think we're on question 10, which is the last question. Any questions? 
I know this is a long session. I should probably break it up into two halves, but anyway, it's too late now. Um, in the diagram, a circle passes through D, B, and E, and diameter E, D. So diameter means middle of the circle, which means that this is a right angle over here. Okay. Then um, of the circle is produced to C, that's there, uh, and AC is the tangent uh, to the circle at B. M is a point on DE that is perpendicular, and <clears throat> chord BE intersect at F, which is over there. Okay, so let's go through quickly. So proof given reasons that FB DM is a cyclic quad. So they want this one. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I didn't actually draw a picture in for you today. I thought I did, but maybe I didn't save it. Okay, so they want that this is a cyclic quad. So it's very straightforward. We can see that because this is bisected, angle M1 is also 90 degrees. Angle B2 is 90 degrees because of angles on a semicircle. So opposite angles of a cyclic quad are equal. Therefore, you have a cyclic quad. Okay. All right, then the next one says, prove that B3 is equal to F1. So, um, we know that <clears throat> we've got B3 is here, and we've got the tan called theorem, which says that D2 is equal to B3. We also know that the exterior angle of a cyclic quad, which we just proved in 10.1.1, is equal to the uh, opposite interior angle of the cyclic quad. So that means D2 is equal to F1. And because B3 is equal to D2, which is equal to F1, B3 is equal to F1, and we have proved what has been asked. Then it says prove that triangle CDB is similar to triangle CBE. Okay, so we've got, I'm gonna just change colors here quickly. So we've got CBD is similar to triangle um, CBE. Okay, and we can see automatically that angle C is common. Okay, then we can also see that the angle it at B1 is a tan chord with angle E. So angle E is equal to B1 because of the tan chord theorem. And then the last angle, which is angle B1 and 2, will be equal to D1 um, because of the third angle in a triangle, or sum of angles in a triangle. Okay, so therefore these two triangles are similar. Then it says, it is further given that CD is two units. So I actually just did it in colors so that you could actually see what was going on. So that's two. And DE is six units. Calculate the length of BC. So they actually want this one here. So we know, we've, we've just proved that your triangles are similar, right? So we have triangle at CDB as similar to triangle C, B, E, okay? And they want B, C. So we can see that there's two options for B, C. There's this one here, and there's this one here. We also have C, D, and we have C, E, okay? Which we just add the two together to give us eight. That will give us C, E. So we can just, Put our ratios together so we've got uh, CB over CD is equal to um, CE uh, you've got to match the umbrellas together over uh, CB okay and we're looking for well, basically BC so these two cross multiplying you've got BC squared is equal to CD times CE okay which is CD is 2 and CE is eight, so that gives us 16. And then we square root, so BC is equal to four. So I'm just gonna draw this into the diagram here. And I'm going to erase this here so that we can do the other 
question quickly. Okay. So the last question says 10.2.2, we're looking for DB, which is this inner line here. Okay. So again, with our ratios, let me just take this out so you can see. And um, we've got um, we've got BC and EC, and we've got DB and uh, BC. Oh, no. What am I done wrong? Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm forgetting how I work out my relationship here. Oh, sorry. That's why. So what we're going to do is actually um, go across the things. So we're going to have DB over BE is equal to, and then we're going to have um, BC over um, um, you know, and I did this question earlier as well. <laughs> I was like, I got this. I know what I'm doing. Um, sorry. Let's just start again. Okay. So, if in doubt, erase and cross out and rewrite it. Okay. So, we've got two triangles. We've got CDB and we've got parallel to uh, CBE. Okay. And we want DB. Okay. So, we've got DB over here in this one, and we've got a BE over here, okay. We've got BC, which we just found, which is either here, or I'm just gonna draw a little dot here. Um, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say BC over EC, so this loop here is equal to, uh, db over be, which is this one here. Okay. And then we're going to get that bc, which we worked out is four, and ec, we worked out is eight, is db over be. So be is um, equal. to two times db, right? Okay. Then we can see that we've got a right angle triangle. So we've got db here. We've got de here, which is six. And we've got be, which we worked out to two db, right? So our formula is our Pythagoras. We're just gonna say de squared is equal to uh, db squared plus BE squared, and we can substitute that in. So that's gonna be four DB squared plus DB squared is five DB squared. So we're gonna have five DB squared is equal to, and DE is six. So that's gonna be six squared is 36. So I'm not gonna <laughs> write it because I've run out of space. So you'd have 36 over five, um, is equal to db squared. And we just find that by saying um, square root of 36 over five, and we get a value of six square root five over five, which gives us two comma six, eight units. Okay, fantastic. Guys, um, that <laughs> after much, Fun and deliberation is the end. Are there any questions? Any thoughts? I know it was a very, very long session. I will put the video up um, by Monday so that if you want to rewatch it again, um, you can. Awesome. Okay. In that case,
Um, thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, I hope you have a great, great evening. And hopefully you do super awesome well for your um, exams going.